Thank you. Yeah. Like Pan said, it's Joel Myers. I'm the lab manager at Mushroom Mountain. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Mushroom Mountain. Um, Trad over there. Um, he's very, very uh, intelligent, very, very good mycologist. So I'm, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to, to be there working with him and learning from him. Um, so today, we're going to talk about mushrooms and kind of what their, their uh, role is on this planet and kind of, kind of some of the unique things you might not know about them um, that, that we can uh, utilize. Um, so the role of fungi. Um, fungi are decomposers. They can be plant symbionts. They can, they can have a mutually beneficial relationship with plants. Um, they can be pathogenic or parasitic. Um, they can be food, obviously, um, and some of them have some really, really powerful medicinal qualities as well. So let's talk about how a mushroom becomes a mushroom first off. You'll see under here we've got uh, that black leftover that you can see came from the bottom of the cap there. Those are spores. So mushrooms don't start from, uh, from seeds like plants, but they start from spores. So a mature mushroom um, is capable of producing millions and millions of these spores every single day. Um, they're very, very light. They have the ability to float on air currents, so they can, they can cross oceans, cross continents, they can, they can go all over. Um, they've tested um, these spores, and they've actually been able to survive space-like conditions as well. Um, so they're very, very hardy. They, they can withstand a lot. Um, so the vast majority of these spores that this mushroom's releasing are not going to land on a suitable substrate for this mushroom to eat. It's, it, the vast majority are going to land on something that it doesn't know how to consume. Um, the lucky few spores that do land on something um, that this mushroom knows how to eat, those spores will germinate and become what we call mycelium. Now this mycelium is like the root structure of the mushroom. Um, that's what you see on this, this petri dish here, those white thread-like uh, filaments going out. That's the mycelium. Um, so this mycelium, once it's germinated and growing, grows out in a three-dimensional format. It doesn't pick a direction and go linearly towards any one particular item. What it's doing is it's trying to take over as much of a territory as possible to ensure its survival. It thinks that it can build up enough biomass that it can keep on going. Um, so the mushrooms that we actually see, like on the ground and stuff like that, it's akin to, to like the apple of the tree. If you go and you pick that mushroom, you've not done any harm to the actual mushroom itself. Those, those mycelium roots are still underneath the ground and are still fine. Um, so as this mushroom is uh, growing through its substrate, um, it's, it's utilizing its sweat in order to, to break this environment down around it. Mushrooms are kind of kind of kind of like us um, in regards to how they eat and stuff. They're actually more closely related to uh, animals than they are plants. Um, and they do a few things that kind of remind us of this. Uh, the first thing is they breathe oxygen, and they, they give off CO2, just like we do. Um, they produce their own body heat as they grow. Some of these bags, um, when I'm growing them at the farm, get quite, quite warm. Um, we have to keep them in like an air-conditioned room, or they'll actually overheat and kill themselves. Um, so they produce their own heat, um, and then they sweat as well. And some of those compounds in the sweat are chemically identical um, to some of the stuff in our sweat as well. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, but so, so more closely related to animals. So we, as humans, we eat our food, and then we have acids and enzymes in our, our digestive system that breaks down that food and delivers nutrients to our body wherever it's needed, right? So mushrooms do the same thing, except they do it inside out. They're going to come into contact with something that they want to be their food source. They're going to sweat out these acids and enzymes into the environment around it. They're going to break it down, and then it will swim through its own waste, absorbing in the nutrition that way. So kind of like us, but, but just a little bit backwards. Um, so as this mycelial network is, is growing through the ground or the log, um, this, this mycelial network is still not capable of producing a, a mushroom, a fruit body. What has to happen is this network has to come into contact or uh, meet up with a compatible partner. It's got to find a mate. Um, so once it uh, comes into contact with something that, that it possibly could, could be its mate, what they do is they date for a little while. They, they, they kind of hang out and swim next to each other for a little while. Um, and they'll do that for, for a good few weeks. Once they've decided that they like each other enough, they'll go ahead and tie the knot. They'll, they'll call it ends, 
call it, or go ahead and get, get married, as you would say. So at this point, they are going to actually fuse together. Um, they fuse together and exchange genetic information and become one singular organism. So what we've done is we've just gone from what's called monokaryotic mycelium to dikaryotic mycelium. So this new dikaryotic mycelial network does have the ability to fruit that mushroom. But it's not going to do that. It's going to continue to grow in three-dimensionally, every direction it's possible, until it feels threatened in some way. And typically, this is by either running out of food um, or it hits, it hits a barrier of some sort. Maybe there's a competitor that it's run into, and it can no longer gain food past that point. Um, but once it runs out of food or feels confined, that's when it's going to pop this mushroom up. It's a defense mechanism. The mushroom it runs out of food, no longer thinks it, it's going to be able to survive. So it pops that mushroom up to create more spores to carry on the genetics to keep that species alive. So that mushroom that you're eating is, is a defense mechanism for that mycelial network. All right, so mushrooms, first and foremost, are decomposers. Um, they are saprotrophs, meaning they feed on dead or decaying matter. Um, they eat wood, leaves, fruits, seeds. Um, and they actually do feed on some animal parts, too. They feed on collagen, um, and they feed on, uh, on dung, on waste. So they're, they're primarily broken up into two kinds of decomposing fungi. You've got your white rot fungi and your brown rot fungi. Um, these are called white rot and brown rot because of the leftovers after this mushroom is done feeding on that wood of how it looks. These white rot fungi have the ability to break down both cellulose and lignin. Um, so it leaves these white, kind of chalky looking material left over. Um, the brown rot fungi only has the ability to break down cellulose. So it leaves those lignin uh, molecules behind, and you end up with this brown, kind of blocky looking uh, wood. So chicken of the woods. This is uh, an example of a brown rot fungi. This is a very, very good mushroom. I don't know, have you, has anybody found a chicken of the woods before? Yeah? A few of you? Do you like them? Delicious. Delicious, right, aren't they? they count, they're chicken of the woods for a reason. They've got a very meaty texture to them. Um, this one also has some pretty potent medicinal compounds. Um, I'll talk, talk about that a little bit later. So here we've just got, we've got some phylotopsis, some nemeco, and some mycena all feeding on that decaying wood. So as they're, they're feeding on this wood, um, they're leaving behind nutrient-rich soil. Um, for plants to, to thrive in. Um, also, as this mycelium network grows, it, it's attracting uh, insects. Worms, in particular, under the ground um, are vectored up to this mycelium from up to 10 feet away, even, even underground. Um, they smell this chemical known as octanol that this mycelium is giving off. This octanol is kind of, it's a sugar, sugary alcohol that these mushrooms produce. And it's chemically identical to what we sweat out. Have you ever gotten really sweaty and noticed you've got all kinds of bugs, like mosquitoes or gnats or stuff drawn to you? That's due to the octanol content in your sweat. So these mushrooms produce that same octanol, um, and, and it vectors in all kinds of insects. Um, so as this mycelium is growing under the ground, vectoring in the worms, the worms are eating the mycelium and depositing worm castings directly at the, the root level, right there, making tons of nutrients available for your plants. Um, one particular, I, I will go back to this one, one particular species, um, I will note if you guys are interested in doing um, some mushrooms in your garden at home, um, there is a mushroom known as King Strafaria. Um, it's a very, very vigorous mushroom, um, and it loves hardwood wood chips. So what we like to do with it is we will take our, uh, our garden area, we'll put down some hardwood wood chips, and then we'll cast out this spawn on top. We'll just kind of shake it up a little bit, kind of get some of those sawdust particles down into the bottom, um, and it'll start to eat all those wood chips. Um, it'll break those wood chips down and deposit that, that food right there for your garden, but they're very, very quick, very, very quick growing. Um, they can decompose your mulch very, very quickly for you. Um, there's really no need to use fertilizers um, if you can use these fungi, because that fungi is breaking down that wood and providing all the nutrients that your plants need without having to use any kind of synthetic fertilizers or anything like that. Um, so it's very, very beneficial in the garden. So mycoforestation. Um, this is something like mycoremediation. Um, it's bioremediation using fungi. Um, so in the past, we've done lots of clear cutting um, out in the wild. Um, 
a lot of devastating things out there. These, these fungi, um, after these clear cuttings and stuff, it, it actually ruins the, uh, the mycelial network of the forest. Um, it kind of damages it. These, these mushrooms, these, these uh, mycorrhizal mushrooms that we'll talk about a little bit more, but they kind of act as uh, shepherds of, of nature, if you will. They kind of control the ebb and flow of which plants get more nutrients and, and whatnot. Um, so some of these mushrooms can also um, absorb toxins. So the oyster mushroom in particular is very, um, very useful in bioremediation um, for its ability to absorb petroleum products. So this oyster mushroom, if you have a, uh, a swath of land that's had an oil spill or, or it's just heavily contaminated with hydrocarbons, you can grow this oyster mushroom on that soil. It will shoot its mycelium down in there and it will pull up all of these petroleum um, products and all these, uh, these hydrocarbons from the soil. Um, what's more is it doesn't actually just hyperaccumulate it. These, these mushrooms are still edible afterwards. That, that oyster mushroom will pull up that oil and actually completely disassemble that molecule um, and leaving the oyster mushroom still edible. Um, so they, these mushrooms, um, being able to, uh, to degrade lignin and uh, uh, in the cellulose as well, so these mushrooms produce enzymes that are capable of breaking down almost almost anything. Um, even the most resistant of uh, substances can be broken down using these enzymes that these mushrooms can exude. Um, they're one of the only organisms that can actually break down and feed on rock. Um, so they're very, very powerful enzymes here. Um, so these mushrooms also um, have the ability to hyperaccumulate heavy metals. So they, they do become contaminated at that point. If you're growing mushrooms in a, in a heavily metal contaminated area, um, those mushrooms are not edible afterwards. Um, they've done some pretty cool stuff with this uh, technology though. There's one company who uh, after learning this went and they got all of our old cell phones, all of our old, old cell phones with teeny tiny little bits of uh, precious metals, golds and stuff like that in there. So what they did was they broke up all these cell phones, mixed it in with some mushroom substrate, grew the mushrooms out on them, they let the mushrooms do the hard work, go down, picked up all the heavy metals, all those precious metals, pulled it back up into the caps. They went, they harvested all those mushrooms and ran those caps through an incinerator. And on the other side, they were left with just all of our precious metals. So recycle all the old metals from our cell phones. So these, they, they're capable of doing some, some pretty unique things um, that a lot of people just don't know about quite yet. What's that? Can they eat plastic? We do, uh-huh, and I'll talk a little bit more about that one, but we do have a couple of strains that are uh, starting to feed on plastic. Um, we're finding these, uh, mushrooms are very quick to evolve and adapt, so what we're finding is in our landfills, um, we can actually go out to our landfills and, and where we've piled up all this trash and stuff, um, and we're finding species of fungi that have already adapted themselves to break down some of these, these piles of trash that we've left. Um, one in particular, Pestilatopsis, has been shown to, to break down a lot of polyurethanes um, and a lot of our harder plastics. Uh -huh. What uh, type of species grow on rock? Well, okay, it's, they're, they're mostly uh, just, it's not actually fruit bearing fungi. Um, it's a lot in the glomeromycota that build the soil and stuff like that. Um, they, they just, they don't actually, well, I guess they do feed on it, but they, they, yeah, they exude these acids and enzymes and what it does is it cracks the rock and it creates little fissures. Um, and then a lot of times a plant root will come in where they've created that crack go down and then split the rock in half over time. Um, so they can continue to break these rocks down into smaller and smaller fragments using these fungi and these rocks, or these uh, plants. So there's the polyurethane degrading fungus. So this is Pestilatopsis microspora. Um, and so they, uh, this one was kind of found by accident, they were actually doing an experiment um, in the forest that had nothing to do with plastic, um, but they noticed they, they were putting these trees under extremely high pressure um, and under some very inhospitable conditions. Um, and what came out was this, this mushroom. Um, this is a, a very common mushroom, or it's not actually a mushroom, it doesn't have a, a fruit bearing surface, um, but it does, it does grow that mycelial network. Um, so this is one that they've done studies on, and the problem is they've only done with liquid. They've, they can break down liquid polyurethane with this mushroom. 
Um, so they've yet to do any actual tests on hard, hard polyurethane. The, the ones that they've done so far have, have shown a little bit of promise, um, but these, these fungi are not like a, an absolute um, solution for these plastics. Um, what's going to be needed is a combination of these fungi in combination with the other yeasts and bacteria to break down these, these plastics. There are some tests going on um, in which people are utilizing more than just the fungi. They're doing those yeasts and those bacteria, and they're having far better results than, than when just using fungi alone. Um, so this is one that we do have at the, at the farm um, at Mushroom Mountain. Um, and we, we are doing experiments um, mixing in polyurethane with our substrates at different ratios, um, different concentrations, and seeing how long it takes this fungus to actually degrade those plastics. So mushrooms can be, uh, or fungi, can be uh, plant symbiotes as well. Um, they form symbiotic relationships with certain plants. Um, so what they do is these are called mycorrhizae, um, and that literally means fungus root. Um, so over 95% of plants on the earth are capable of making this, uh, this association with these fungi. Um, so what they do is these, uh, these fungi will actually go and they will surround the roots of these plants, and then they will exchange nutrients with the, the tree or the plant, the host plant. Um, so that tree or that plant is going to provide sugars for this mushroom that it creates th through photosynthesis in exchange for this fungus to bring up carbon and nitrogen from the soil that it's breaking down um, in, an, in, in its environment. Um, so these, these fungi can uh, increase tolerance as well for these plants. If that fungi can last in a, in a very hot, let's say that very high temperatures, um, it actually passes on some of that ability to the plant itself. They've done testing um, where they've taken what's called extremophile uh, mycorrhizae, meaning these mycorrhizae were found in very extreme environments, um, either very hot or very cold or very wet, um, something like that. But they've taken these ones that were uh, found in the desert um, they're very well adapted for the heat, and they inoculated them onto the roots of, uh, of agricultural crops. And then they, they had the test plot without the agricultural crops. So when they grew these in a very, very high heat environment, um, what they saw was the, uh, the one without the mycorrhizae, they all started to die. They all started to pass away. But the ones with the mycorrhizae they thrived. They made it through the entire season um, with, with those uh, mycorrhizal fungi. Um, so they, they wouldn't have been able to do that without that partnership. So there are a couple different kinds of mycorrhizal fungi. We have what's called ectomycorrhizae and endomycorrhizae. So the ectomycorrhizae is limited to the outside of the roots. It basically just creates a sheath. It wraps up the roots in those hyphal threads. Um, and then it uses that sheath to exchange nutrients with the root system. Now, the endomycorrhizae are a little bit different. These actually penetrate in through the root cells and actually enter inside the root of that plant. Um, and they form what are called arbuscules. Um, and these arbuscules are kind of nutrient packages. They create these little balls in which they fill up with these nutrients um, to exchange with that plant. So morel mushrooms. How many of you are familiar with morels? Can we go back to the, uh, in the previous one there about the, uh, the mycorrhizae? Do we know which uh, fungus are associated with which plants? So there are thousands and thousands of different uh, mycorrhizae um, plants. And you'll see a lot of them. Um, they're becoming more and more popular to put into plant foods and stuff like that, even when you're finding them at Home Depot and stuff. Um, but we, we do know um, most of the, the mycorrhizae can form relationships with a, a wide, wide array of plants. Um, brassicas are one that is kind of a particular. They don't take to all of the mycorrhizal plant or mycorrhizal fungi. Um, there's only just a couple of uh, fungi that are actually capable of making that relationship with the brassica family, being like the broccolis and stuff. Um, but the majority of other plants, they, they have a huge array of these, uh, these mycorrhizae. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Um, and that's like the, uh, the morel mushrooms. This is an example of a mycorrhizal uh, fungi, um, is the morel mushroom. And it's mycorrhizal with uh, tulip poplars, with ash trees. Um, you see them on elms sometimes. Um, but this is a mushroom. We, we've, we get these around here. Um, last year was my first season here. I'm from Oklahoma originally. So um, I 
trying to find my new morel spot, and I've, I've had yet to find a good one. I found this one um, last year along with two other ones, and they were kind of in, in sad condition. Um, so I'm hoping this year I'll, I'll find a good new spot. Morels are uh, delicious, delicious mushrooms. A lot of people don't know, though, that they Monomethylhydrazine. Um, it's what we use as rocket fuel. Um, so, if any of you have heard of the false morels, um, stay away from those. That's because of their extremely high content of this monomethylhydrazine. Um, so, but these the regular edible morels, they do contain that chemical, so you've got to cook them. That chemical is not heat stable, so as soon as you put them in the pan, it, it dissipates. Uh, you do want to cook them in a you know, ventilated area, though, because the gases are still toxic as well. Trumpets, um, rel relative of the uh, the chanterelle there. How, how many of you had, have had black trumpets? Very nice. So this one's good. I like to put it in like a like a soup. Black trumpets are my favorite. Soup. Um, but we find these around here as well. And then we find lots and lots of these around the golden chanterelle. So all of these mushrooms that I've just shown you are all examples of mycorrhizal fungi. All of these mushrooms require that symbiotic relationship with a host plant. We actually can't create a fruit body from these. These are non-cultivatable mushrooms. The morels, the chanterelles, the black trumpets, we can't grow those because they require that mycorrhizal relationship. Now I can take it back to the lab and I can clone it and I can create mycelium for it, but I cannot make that mycelium create a fruit body until it finds that, that host plant. So pathogen and parasites. Um, so fungi can be parasitic to plants, animals, insects, and other fungi as well. We've got a nice cricket there, nice little horned cricket. So here's an example of a, uh, a plant pathogen. This is called cedar apple rust. Um, so this fungus will, will take, take hold of its, uh, its host plant there. Um, it'll lower the yields, and it'll create these kind of deformed balls on there. Um, they actually look pretty interesting um, if, you, if you get to see them. They're, they're kind of interesting. Oh, they're not one you would want to, want to eat. Uh -huh. You can eat once. Once, yeah, that's right. That's right. Every fungus is edible once. Once. So this is another one. This is a of the corn plant, Ustilago matis. They call this corn smut. It's an amazing name, I know. Uh, so this is actually considered a delicacy in Mexico. I can't try this myself, um, but I do hear it's really, really good. I hear it's got a kind of a texture like avocado um, and kind of a sweet, Swedish kind of taste to it. Um, so we've got a, uh, a jar of this back at the, at the farm um, that I'm, I'm ready to break out and give it a try. Um, this is one that we're playing around with trying to cultivate as well. Um, it's, it's considered an, an infection to most farmers. Um, if it gets into your crop, it, it'll ruin your crop. Um, but this is one that we, we are trying to cultivate for, for its uh, culinary value. So we'll, we'll see how it goes. Last year we tried um, and we didn't have so much luck. Um, the way you inoculate them is through the silks of the corn stack coming up. Um, you actually take, and I'll take the mycelium and just pack it onto the silks, and it'll feed on the silks and run into the corn, and then infect each one of those single uh, corns. Our malaria, this is uh, the honey mushroom. So they, they deemed this mushroom, um, or at least one, one specimen in Oregon, they deemed it the humongous fungus. Um, now some people say this is the largest living organism on the planet. Um, it spans over 2,200 acres. Um, it is a huge, huge organism. Um, the only way that they were able to verify that it was actually the single organism um, was doing genetic testing um, on, on each side of it. Um, and they did find out that it surely it does. It, sp it spans 2,200 acres. Um, so this is parasitic to oak and fir trees. Um, and it can, it can cause a lot of damage. I bet you've all probably seen these coming up. When they come up in the spring, they come up everywhere, everywhere. Um, they are edible. They're, they're, they're not terrible. Um, they're not my favorite mushroom, um, but they're, they are edible. Some people really like them. They're called the honey mushroom because of the, uh, the color on the cap, not because the So the lobster mushroom, hypomyces. 
Now this is a, uh, a parasite of other fungus. So this hypomyces um, will infect lacterious and rustula mushrooms. So most of those lacterious were edible to begin with, um, and these, this hypomyces actually makes it taste better. Um, it actually makes it taste really, really good. Um, and so rustulas are actually, a, most of those are non-edible. A lot of those, you, you can't eat them until this mushroom jumps on and actually takes over. Um, and then it becomes an edible, edible mushroom. It converts a non-edible into an edible. Um, so these are, these are very good. They don't taste anything like lobster. Um, that's strictly a visual. Um, they've got a very hard kind of crust shell looking thing on them. Um, but they, they're very, very nice. And then we have mushrooms that are uh, parasitic to uh, insects. Um, these are known as entomopathogens. Um, so cordyceps is a pretty, uh, pretty popular one within the entomopathogen category. Um, they, they attack all kinds of different insects from, uh, from the crickets we were just showing you to uh, uh, cicadas. Um, we've got them for uh, black soldier fly. We've got them for honeybee, unfortunately. Um, we just got one in stock for the uh, varroa mites. So if any of you are beekeepers or know anything about that, um, the varroa mites uh, contribute to the uh, colony collapse disorder. So we've got a, uh, a fungus that will actually kill off these varroa mites. Um, so we just got a hold of it. We're, we're going to do some testing with it soon. Um, so this is kind of the typical life cycle of, a, of an ant that has been infected with a cordyceps mushroom. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of explain what happens in that scenario. So if if there was an ant who was crawling along with the rest of his ant colony um, and somehow became infected with this cordyceps mushroom, what would happen is this mushroom actually it has the ability to modify the behavior of its host. So this, this fungus can cause this ant to do things that it normally wouldn't do. Um, it kind of, kind of becomes a zombie ant at this point. It's under control of the fungus. So the fungus, the first thing it's going to do is have this ant crawl away from the rest of his colony. He's going to have that ant crawl up a tree and out onto the bottom of a limb. The mushroom is then going to have this ant clamp his jaws down into the bottom of this branch. Then the fungus will actually melt the jaw muscles of the ant, fusing it to, to the branch that it's bitten onto so it cannot let go. Then it will, it will go ahead and kill off the ant, and then it will uh, pop that little thread-like mushroom at the back of its head. So what's more is this, uh, this fungus has caused the ant to orient himself to where he's directly above the rest of the colony. So as he sticks out that mushroom and starts to release those spores, he's infecting the rest of the colony underneath. So if a, uh, if a guard ant actually catches one of these infected ants before it's had time to finish that process, the guard ants will take the infected ant, they'll go far, far away from the colony, they will actually decapitate the infected ant, they will cut the head off of that ant, and they will bury him in the ground. So at this point, the guard ant has been in contact with the pathogen. So he will not go back to the rest of the colony. He will go and he will dig a hole and he, he will bury himself for the good of the colony. So self-sacrifice, uh-huh. So we do, it's not a cordyceps, um, but we are running trials right now with a, uh, a strain of fungus known as metarhizium um, that does feed on fire ants. Um, so we've got a bunch of fire ant hills up at the farm right now that we've got flagged and we're trying to figure out the best application method. Um, so we know that it works. We've killed lots of fire ants with it. So now we're just trying to figure out how we can turn it into a marketable product. Um, these, these are very, very good for, uh, for biopesticides. A lot of these fungi um, are huge, um, huge opportunities for these, these biopesticides. Uh -huh. No, that's, that's something we're not quite exactly sure. Um, we, it's theorized it's like a hormonal release thing um, that induces different behaviors, different reactions, um, but it's, it's not, not, not known. It's very sci-fi. I know they've actually come up with a couple of, uh, somebody at one of my tours the other day was telling me about a, a video game that they've come out with called The Last of Us. And it's about cordyceps that has uh, evolved to feed on people. So 
Uh huh. The time frame is just a, a couple of weeks. It's just a couple of weeks. Once that ant's infected, it's usually just a day or two uh, before he, he goes up. So um, there, there is some, uh, some debate on to how these insects become infected. Um, so it's, a lot of people theorize that it has to come into contact with the fungus somehow. Either the fungus is present on a leaf or something like that. Um, well, a, uh, a, a, uh, another theory is that these ants or these insects have that fungus lying dormant, um, kind of in an anamorph stage on the insect itself. And it just doesn't express itself or start to grow until the insect's immune system has been lowered in some way. So if that ant starts to get sick, that's when the fungus is going to take over and, and start to do that. Um, so it's still, like I said, it's still not known. Um, there still needs to be a lot more study in depth with the cordyceps. So. There's one on the uh, a wasp. Get some good pictures. The cricket, camel cricket. That looks like a, like a grub. We've got some a, a worm of sorts. Um, Cordyceps militaris. So this is a pretty popular one. Um, this one commonly grows on caterpillars. Um, so you can see it growing off the, the pupae there. Um, so this mushroom uh, produces a, a chemical called cordycepin. Um, so it's a vasodilator. It opens up the blood vessels and increases your heart rate. Um, this one is good for, for athletes. Um, it increases energy levels. It increases stamina. Um, it increases libido. Um, so this mushroom, this, uh, this cordycepin, is actually on the restricted list for Olympic athletes. Um, so Olympi Olympians are not allowed to have this. They consider it a performance-enhancing drug. Um, so most uh, mushrooms. Um, do have some medicinal benefits, um, and we sell extracts for a lot of these mushrooms. But most of them, I would not say that you would be able to like, actually feel something happening after you took these medicinal extracts or these supplements. Um, this is one that I, I feel like I've taken an energy drink um, after I take like, a couple, couple uh, drops of it. Um, so it's, it's a powerful one. Um, so this one is actually, we're actually uh, growing this one now. Um, we found out we can cultivate it without the insect, so we don't have to kill off any bugs. So we can grow this on a, on a rice media um, with a little bit of sugar in there. Um, and it still produces all those cordycepin compounds and st it still has all the medicinal benefits. Uh-huh. Can you sell these to like, homeopathic drugstores? Um, soon, soon to be. Uh -huh. So we, we just started um, selling these. We actually opened up a, 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 another company, Michael Matrix is what we're calling it, and that's our extract company. Um, so right now we have four extracts available, and we're selling them out online, and we're selling them out of the, the, our retail store at home. I don't believe that we, we have anybody carrying them in the stores yet, um, but we are talking to some stores to get them in there. Mm -hmm. um, at home, do you mean easily? Yes, yes, I mean easily. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Do the course of species two have male and female mycelium, or are they one where? Because I know some of them don't need to do that, like certain. Mycelium. So, just curious, because there's not a lot of room in like a bug. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so that's, it's, it's difficult. They, it does require, yeah, it is complicated. So the sex life of mushrooms is very, very complicated. As humans, we have male and we have female. Some mushrooms have upwards of 26,000 mating pairs, mating types. So it's, it's a whole different ball game. Um, it's very difficult, but yes, it is one. It, it's not capable of producing that mushroom without binding up. Um, uh huh. Uh huh. So typically, though, you you find these. It's not very hard for that mycelial network to find a pair because this mushroom is producing so many spores all at once. In the, in that area directly around where they've getting those spores, that's where most of those spores are going to land and germinate. So chances are that it's going to find one that came off of that same mushroom with it, and it's going to match up and pair with that. Um, so it, it doesn't need to be like two spores from two different mushrooms or anything like that. Both of those spores can come off of the same mushroom. Some spiders. And like I said, we just get the, the metarhizium that feeds on the varroa mites. Um, so we're, we're hoping to, uh, to test this out and see exactly how, how well it works here soon. 
So food and medicine. Um, so obviously these mushrooms can, can provide food for us, um, but they also have some very, very potent medicinal compounds as well. Um, so these mushrooms are very high in protein. They're very, very high in vitamins A and vitamin D. Um, and they, they also provide a, a bunch of uh, minerals and things like that for you. They have selenium, copper, niacin, vitamin C. Um, so this oyster mushroom that you see over there, this one actually has a protein content about double that of uh, chicken or fish calorie per calorie. So it's got twice as much protein as chicken or fish or eggs calorie per calorie. So these guys are also very high in vitamin D. Um, a cool thing about mushrooms is they, they kind of, uh, you, can, you can raise their vitamin D content, kind of like us. We get vitamin D from the sun, right? We've got melanin um, that, that gives us vitamin D from the sunlight. So mushrooms have a, uh, a similar compound. Um, mushrooms contain the precursor uh, to vitamin D, known as ergosterol, um, and it's got it in very high numbers. So once this ergosterol is uh, put under UV light, it converts to vitamin D. Um, so you can take a, a fresh mushroom or a dry mushroom, and if I take it and put it outside in the sunlight with the gills up, I can raise the vitamin D content of that mushroom by up to 500%. Uh, so they now sell supplement, uh, vitamin D supplemented mushrooms. Um, a lot of the button mushrooms that you'll find at the store are these vitamin D supplemented. Um, and what they've done with that is they take these mushrooms, they'll put them on a, uh, a conveyor belt, and they'll run them through these strobing UV lights. And it just takes a couple of seconds, just a couple of UV flashes, and they've raised the vitamin D content of that mushroom um, by, by a few hundred percent. Um, so it's, they're, they're pretty, pretty interesting. Just the oysters? Or no, that's most, most mushrooms, uh-huh. With, with gills or pores? Pores and gills, uh-huh. They both, both have the vitamin D and are both able, capable of doing it. Very long. So they've taken uh, mushrooms that had been dry for uh, over a year. And they took them, they were shiitake mushrooms. They took these mushrooms and they put them outside um, after they tested the vitamin D content. And they, they brought them back inside um, after just a couple of hours. And it had significantly raised the, the vitamin D content. Um, and the reason why you can do that with a dry mushroom is because it, it's not actually the mushroom producing that vitamin D or anything like that. That, that mushroom had ergosterol when it was picked and dried, so it had high numbers of ergosterol. So as soon as you put that in UV light, the ergosterol converts to vitamin D. So Uh huh. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, it doesn't. It doesn't dissipate so much. It's it's very neat. So yep. Like I said, one one gram of mushroom powder. Um, exposed to UV light has the potential to give you 5,000 IUs of vitamin D. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty significant amount there. So if you're not getting enough sunlight, you got to eat, eat some more mushrooms. Including dry mushrooms? Including dry mushrooms. Cool. Mm -hmm. And yes, it's, it's very, very easy, very bioavailable. It's easy for your body to take up. So Saccharomyces cerevisiae, um, this is the, uh, the yeast responsible for our alcoholic beverages. Um, without fungus, we wouldn't have beer or wine or any of those wonderful drinks like that. Um, so here you see a picture. This is us uh, actually dosing a, uh, a keg with our mushroom extract. It's, it's one of our favorite drinks to make around the, the farm is a uh, medicinal mushroom beer. Um, so each one of our medicinal mushroom extracts has a little bit of a different flavor. So it's, you got to go and you got to find which extract goes with which style of beer better. So like a Rishi Red is good, a Chaga, Chaga Amber is nice. Um, so it, it, in all truthfulness, though, it is a great way uh, to get your medicine. I was going to say it, it, it's very highly bi bioavailable um, and it's, it's an easy way to take it. So it's, that's, that's a common one. We actually do uh, beer tasting sometimes in uh, oh, the barn house. Are, are any of you familiar with that bar? No? So you'll have to come find us one day when we're out there. We'll actually, we take our mushroom extracts out there and sometimes we'll, we'll, do, we'll dose all their kegs and they'll have a big, a big night where they're selling all our mushroom beer. Um, so you'll have to come try it out. The barn house? Uh-huh. Where's it at? 
That's a good question. I was just trying to think of that, and I, I can't recall exactly. I keep wanting to say Greenville, uh, but I think it's a little outside somewhere. Could be, yeah. So the medicinal benefits. So these mushrooms um, are capable of uh, modulating our immune system. Um, they can help with uh, inflammation and sugar regulation, so good for, for diabetes and things like that. Um, they're good for nerve degeneration and disorders, anything neuro neurological. Um, they can be antifungal, antibacterial. Um, they can help, help with cancer. Um, and they can also inhibit, inhibit viruses. So a little bit about the immune system real quick, so we can show you exactly how these mushrooms are helping your immune system. Um, so your immune system is comprised of, I'm going to give you the, the simple version. You've got your T cells, your B cells, and your natural killer cells, your NK cells. So these three cells are, are what's responsible for keeping your immune system active, for keeping you going. Um, these are responsible for recognizing pathogens that don't belong. They mark these pathogens that don't belong, and then the natural killers come in and they destroy these compromised cells. Um, so they, they recognize and they attack the, the, these cells that don't belong in your body. So beta-glucans. Mushrooms um, in their cell walls have a, uh, a, a long sugar chain, these polysaccharides. Some of them are, are beta-glucans. Beta-glucans hit our, uh, our lower intestines, and they activate those cells that we just talked about, those T cells, those B cells, and those NK cells. So this is a, a pretty popular medicinal mushroom. Um, this one used to be the, uh, uh, all right, uh, I'm sorry, PSK derived from this mushroom used to be the number one prescription medication given to cancer patients going through chemotherapy. Um, this PSK was used to keep your immune system up, to keep those cells active while you're going through chemo and radiation therapy and things like that. Um, so it helps your body keep itself healthy. Um, so this one is uh, common. You can find turkey tail um, all throughout the world. Um, it comes in a bunch of different colors. Um, the, the Latin name is Trimedes versicolor, meaning one who is thin and various colorings. Um, so I've seen these anywhere from blue, green, orange, all kinds of different ones. They do have some, uh, some lookalikes out there, some false turkey tails. Um, the way you can tell the difference is if you look at the bottom of a turkey tail mushroom, it's going to have pores on it. It's going to have a lot of teeny tiny little holes in there. Some of the lookalikes are going to either be completely smooth, there's not going to be any pores. Um, typically those are, those are sterium, a crust fungi, or they're going to have gills. If it's got gills or it's, got, it's just completely smooth, um, these, these, uh, they're, they're the false turkey tail. So you're looking for those pores is what you want to see. Griffola frondosa. So this is my, probably my favorite go-to edible mushroom. I'm, I'm a big fan of the morels and some of the other mycorrhizal mushrooms. Um, but as far as mushrooms that you can cultivate and eat, this is definitely by far my favorite. Um, and it's also super, super uh, beneficial as well. Um, so maitake in Japanese means dancing mushroom. Um, I like to dance when I see it. I, I don't know why else they, they would have called it that. I get excited. Um, but it's found primarily at the base of uh, dead or dying oak trees. Um, and we do get these around here. I know last year, um, my first, first month, I found a 35-pound specimen. Um, it took, took both arms to carry it. I had to walk through like this. Um, but it was, it was amazing, and it was delicious. So I, I turned that into a dinner for a few days and then made a, a nice extract out of it as well. Um, but this one is uh, anti-diabetic. Um, it reduces hypertension, and it has a, a, a protein, a glycoprotein, known as SX fraction, um, which has been found to lower blood pressure, cholesterol, and blood sugar levels. Um, so this is one that's very good for, for diabetes and things like that as well. Um, and this one also, in particular, has been shown to be highly effective against uh, breast cancer, in particular. So it's, it's got a lot of anti-cancer properties, but breast cancer, it's very, very anti-cancer. So reishi, Ganoderma lucidum. Are, are any of you familiar with the reishi mushroom? Yeah? A couple of you? 
So you can, you can find these ones around here. The, uh, the true version, the Ganoderma lucidum, is not native to the US. You can't find the lucidum. But here, here we get uh, Ganoderma cuticei, the uh, golden reishi mushroom. Um, and we get one, Ganoderma suge, which grows on hemlock, or hemlock trees. Um, so this one, they call this the mushroom of immortality. Um, it's the most widely grown, sold, traded medicinal mushroom on the planet. Um, so it grows on elm, alder, oak, maple. But it, it, this, is, uh, this is one that regulates that immune response. It's, it's got these, uh, these triterpenes that also offer uh, liver protection um, and have been shown to be very anti-cancerous as well. Um, they also help with uh, met metabol metabolism. Um, so this is, uh, this is the one I, I recommend for everybody. It's basically just like the panacea. It's just everything. It, it just increases uh, everything good in your body. It just helps out with, with all of it. What's that? It tastes good? Um, no. No, it does not. Uh, so it's, it's actually very, very bitter. Um, so it's, it's got a texture like that of uh, cork or wood, too. You wouldn't really want to chew on it. Um, so this is one we recommend making a tea with. A lot of those, those beneficial medicinal compounds are soluble in water. So if you just simply make a, like a tea with them, you can just drink that tea. Maybe put some honey in there to get rid of some of that bitterness. Uh -huh. um, so the other alternative is you can make a, a, an alcohol, a double extraction um, with this as well. Um, so double extractions, um, I'll go over how to make those really quick. Have it, are, has anybody made extractions before? Tinctures? A couple of you? OK, so it's a really simple process. All you need is a, is a high proof alcohol. Um, grain alcohol, we use like Everclear is the best. The higher, the better. But if you have a preference for whiskey or rum or, or flavor like that, you could also use something like that. Um, but if it's got a little bit of a lower alcohol content, you're going to want to leave it in for longer. So all you're going to do is you're going to grind up this mushroom. Um, you're going to put it into a mason jar. And then you're going to just barely cover it with that grain alcohol just where it's barely covered. So you're going to leave that in there, and you're going to shake it up. You're going to agitate this jar every single day. You're going to leave it in there for a minimum of two weeks. So after this two-week period is up, you're going to pour it through a, through a coffee filter, and you're going to collect all the, uh, the alcohol in a jar, and then you're going to take that leftover mushroom material called the mark, and you're going to put this in a pot, and you're going to basically do the hot water extraction. You're going to make tea with it. So you'll put it in a pot, cover that just barely with water, and you're going to simmer that for six to eight hours or so. So after that six to eight hour process is done, you're going to filter off the, the water, and then you can combine your water with your alcohol to create a full spectrum product. So typically, we try to keep the, the ratio. Um, we, we like to end up with a 20% alcohol content by volume. Um, so we'll, we'll do one part alcohol to, to four parts water. Does that make sense? Everybody, everybody get the extracts? All right, so yep, genoderic acid, that triterpene. So Hericium arenaceus. Um, this is a really good one. I actually brought one of these guys with me to show you guys. Um, this one grows on oaks around here. You can find it as big as a, uh, as a basketball. Here, I'll, I'll pass this around if you guys want. This is also the most pettable mushroom. Uh, it's very, very soft. So if you guys want to pass that around while I'm talking. Uh, but this one tastes like, a, like shellfish. It tastes like lobster, of all things. So it, it tastes very, very good. Um, and it is also highly, highly medicinal. Um, it has these hericians and erinaceans um, that enable this mushroom to actually regrow brain cells. Um, so it acts the ability to regrow adult brain cells. Um, isn't it good for throat cancer? It is good for throat cancer as well. Uh -huh. It's got a lot of antibacterial properties as well. So they're using this mushroom in clinical studies with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's patients. Um, in some of those cases, it's actually reversed the effects of the disease. Um, so it's, it's been shown to be very promising for anything neurodegenerative or, or for cognitive function. Um, it helps with memory retention. Um, basically, any, anything cognitive related, it, it benefits. Um, so it's a, it's a really good mushroom. Um, it also modulates the immune system like most of the others through those beta-glucans. Um, but it, it improves digestive tract function as well. Uh -huh. Are all those available if you cook it, or would you need to make it tea or a tincture? They are available if you cook it. Uh -huh. it it's more concentrated and more bioavailable in a tincture form. Um, but you do get those benefits in the mushroom from eating it too. Um, cooking it, 
does destroy a little bit of the compound still, but not more than like 10%. Um, so it's not as bad as some people think. Some people think if you cook the mushroom, you're, you're going to cook off all the beneficial compounds and stuff like that. And it does lower it a bit, but it's usually no more than 10% or so. Um, so in, in cooking your mushrooms also, I'll talk about that a little bit too. You, you, most of your mushrooms out there, you do want to cook. Um, so these cell walls of these mushrooms, they've, they've got those beta-glucans in them, but they're actually made of a, uh, a material called chitin. Um, so chitin is what crab shells are made out of. Um, so it's a very tough, very hard material. Um, so we as a species do not have the enzymes and acids available um, to us that we need in order to digest this, this chitin. They theorize that we, uh, some, there's a small percentage of the population who does have these enzymes. Um, but they theorize that we lost these enzymes um, when we uh, transitioned um, from hunter-gatherers into to kind of more, more stay and put and actually cooking our food. Once we started to cook our food, we no longer needed those enzymes to break it down for us because we were doing it ourselves with heat. So eventually, we just evolved and lost, lost those enzymes. Um, but yeah, you do want to cook them. If you don't cook your mushroom, um, a lot of those beneficial compounds remain locked up inside those chitinous walls. You actually can't get to them until you heat up those, those bonds and break those chitinous bonds. Uh-huh. When are they ready to pick? I mean, what's, what stage is it growth? Um, for these ones in particular? Yes. Um, the teeth. So the one I'm passing around right there, that's a pretty good stage right there. You, you look for the teeth elongation. When they're very old, the teeth will be very, very long. Um, my favorite time to pick them is right about then, right before the teeth start getting real, real icicly. Um, the younger they are, I find, I find the better they taste to me. Did you find this in the wild? This is one that was found in the wild, and we brought it back in and cloned it and then cultured it out. So yeah, it, it's originally from the wild. I think that one came from uh, the experimental forest, I believe, over in Clemson. Um, so that's most of the mushrooms that we do have at the farm um, are, are wild isolated. We found them out in the wild, um, brought them back into the farm, and then we cloned them and cultured them out that way. So we've got about two, 250 species, I think, um, that we do, um, along with about 30 entomopathogens, 30 of those, uh, those insect-loving fungi. Um, so we've, we've got a pretty, pretty nice little collection. So yeah, lion's mane, definitely, definitely a good one. Tastes like shellfish, regrows brain cells. Can't beat that. So this is another cordyceps mushroom. This is not the, like the militaris. This is cordyceps subsessless. Um, so if any of you are familiar with cyclosporin, um, this is a, uh, an immune suppressant used in surgeries to uh, help prevent uh, transplant rejection. So if you get an organ transplant, they're using this to help your body accept it um, and, try, and try not to reject that transplant. Um, so a lot, of, uh, a lot of our medication these days actually did derive from, from a fungus. Um, they, they just take these fungi compounds and they, they turn them into these, these pharmaceuticals. The, the PSK, the cyclosporin, there's some other examples as well. So the psilocybe mushrooms. So these guys kind of have a bad stigma about them. Um, these are illegal to cultivate or to possess here in the U.S., um, but they, I do believe that they have their place in the world. Um, so Johns Hopkins is doing a lot of studies with these, um, and they've been shown to be uh, beneficial for anxiety, um, depression, um, PTSD. We have a lot of uh, vets coming back from, from Iraq um, who, who have taken part in some of these studies, um, and it's been shown to alleviate this, this heavy PTSD um, that they have. Um, so in a, uh, a, a study done with 36 volunteers um, who were given this, these mushrooms, um, they, they rated the experience as positive. And then a year later, when they were called back and re-interviewed, um, they said that the experience was a, definitely uh, a good one. It increased their sense of well-being um, and life satisfaction. So even after a year, they considered this, this experience to have benefited their life. Um, in a big way. A lot of them were very adamant that it was a very, very needed experience in their life. Uh, what's that? That's right. That's right. Um, oh, thank you. These are my favorite. Lion's Man? Yeah. Oh, they're great. I found like eight in the past fall. I've never had one before. Did you? Yeah. Nice. They're yeah. Fantastic. 
they're, they're good to eat or they're good to make those uh, extracts with too. Um, yeah, I've never tried to make one of those. It's not difficult, yeah. Give it a go. I definitely would. Um, so yeah, these have their place in the world. Um, so the main uh, constituents in these guys are, are the hallucinogenic compounds, um, psilocin, psilocybin, and baocystin. Um, so these are the chemicals responsible for the, uh, the spiritual experience that you have. Um, it's related to, a, it's similar to, to a serotonin compound. Um, so it, it, it gets into those uh, serotonin receptors. Um, they're still not exactly sure what causes the, uh, the hallucinations and stuff like that. Um, so here is a, uh, one of those magic mushrooms in the wild growing right next to uh, a, an amanita, a, a deadly amanita. So one of those guys is going to help you uh, come to terms with death, and the other one's going to get you there much quicker. Um, so. The, that Amanita there, we, we get a lot of these in this area around here too. I was very surprised when I moved up here. Um, Amanita is the genus in which some of the most deadly mushrooms in, on the planet are in. Um, so these mushrooms contain a, a, these amatoxins is what they're called. Um, and these amatoxins, if you ingest just a little bit of one of these mushrooms, even, even as small as my pinky nail or something, it has the potential to kill you. Um, what it does is it gets into your system. Um, and, it, and it gets into your liver. Um, if you were to consume one of these mushrooms, you would feel okay for about 12 hours or so. After 12 hours, you would start to feel like you're coming down with the flu. You might have a headache, your body just kind of starts to ache, and you get an upset stomach. Um, so those symptoms will persist for two to three days, and then you'll start to feel like you're recovering. You're gonna feel like you're starting to get better. And then your liver shuts down, and you pass away. And uh, it's very quick. If you do not know that you've been poisoned by one of these mushrooms, it can be very hard for a doctor to tell um, exactly what's happening. And usually by the time they do, it's, it's a little too late. There is no cure for it. Um, the, on, the only uh, therapies that they're using right now that have been shown to have any promise are that using milk thistle extract. Um, so there, there are some doctors now using a, a combination of therapies, including that one, um, that have been shown to, to be very promising. Um, I know they are, they are actually able to save a lot of people now. Um, TRAD actually is on the, uh, the list for the hospital and for the vets. Dogs are the number one animal poisoned by these mushrooms each year. So if you've got a, a dog who, who likes to chomp down on stuff, you keep an eye on them. Um, but yeah, Trad has gotten phone calls in the middle of the night to try and ID a mushroom that either a dog or somebody has, has eaten. Um, so he has to sit there and, and usually look at a pile of vomit and try and tell what kind of mushroom is in there. Uh, so props to him. I don't think I could do that. Um, but he, he's, he's actually helped out a couple of people that way. Uh -huh. Is the one on the left the dangerous one? The one on the left, the all white one. Yep, that is the dangerous one. Um, so it, kind of an easy way to identify these mushrooms um, is, is by the base. You can see it's got kind of a white cap. Some of the other deadly amanitas have like a gray or kind of a yellowish cap. Um, but the easy identifying factor is the base. You can't really see it here because it's under the leaves, but the base of this mushroom gets very wide. It's got this stipe, the, the stem that just goes down, and then it's got a very bulbous base. So that bulbous base is a, is a good indicator that it's in the Amanita genus. There are some others that have these bulbous faces as well, but just as a generalization, if you see that bulbous base, it's probably best to stay away from it. Um, sometimes it even comes out of uh, what looks like an egg sac, known as a vulva. Um, so these, if it's got the bulbous base or an egg sac, it's probably best not to try and eat that mushroom. Now the toxins in it are not transdermal. So you can, you can handle this mushroom. You could pick it up and look at it and check it out, um, but you don't, don't want to eat it. You could actually even taste it if you wanted to. Um, they taste sweet, actually. Um, I have tasted them before. Um, you spit it out immediately, and then you're very paranoid for the next few hours. Um, but but it, it's, it's a very sweet flavor, and that's, that's why it's bad for, uh, for animals. It's because a dog will come up on this, smell it, and, and want to eat it because it's so sweet. Um, so definitely keep an eye on those. So jack-o'-lantern, this is another toxic mushroom. Um, so we, we've actually cultivated this mushroom out before. Um, and you might wonder why we would grow out a, a, a toxic mushroom. Like, what, what is the point in that? Um, so even toxic mushrooms have the ability to, uh, to be beneficial um, medically for us. Um, and how that is, is with their sweat. 
So we know that when a mushroom comes into contact with a, a food source, it sweats out in order to break it down, right? So it does that in order to defeat a competitor organism as well. When it comes into contact with something that it, it's fighting off, it's going to start to sweat out those acids and enzymes. Um, but what it's going to do is it's going to change the composition of this sweat every single time it does it in order to, uh, to, to defend whatever or fight off whatever it is that's in front of it. So it's not just like a, a one-size-fits-all kind of liquid enzyme that they shoot out. They change this, this chemical cocktail up um, to be specific for whatever is in front of it. Um, so what we can do with that is we can match it against um, some, some pathogens um, against us. So here we've got a, uh, I believe that's a shiitake mycelium down in the bottom, the square there. That's a shiitake mycelium. And up we've got the, uh, the bacteria up there. So naturally, this bacteria on this plate is going to norm what you would normally see is they would grow towards each other and want to fuse. They would want to meet up. Um, but when we put this mycelium on the plate, what we see is that this bacteria is scared. It, it does not want to be anywhere near that mycelium. It's running away. So this, this is a good indication that this mushroom has in, inhibitory effects against whatever pathogen um, that we've matched it up with. So we can take this idea and, and find a way to utilize it. So if, if we had the shiitake and it was uh, effective against E. coli, right? So what we can do is we've got a cutting board here. So we've taken our cutting board and we've inoculated it with shiitake mycelium that we know to be effective against E. coli. So this mycelium is going to grow all throughout that cutting board. We can simply scrape off the excess mat. And now that mycelium is actually infused into the cutting board. So what we have is a naturally antimicrobial cutting board there. It'll just keep fighting off, uh, fighting off E. coli for you. So there's more bacteria. So this, this unique ability um, offers promise here in the future because of our, uh, our antibiotic um, dilemma that we're in. So our pathogens out there are becoming resistant to all of our last resort antibiotics. We no longer have medicine for some of the things that are out there. We, we don't know how to, to fight it or beat it off. Um, and that's where we think mushrooms can play a huge role. Um, their ability to, to change the, co the chemical cocktail of the sweat to defeat off whatever is in front of it um, is, is, a, is a huge ability. Um, and we found that these, some of these mushrooms can fight off things like, like MRSA. Um, chicken of the woods. We have the chicken of the woods uh, kills MRSA. Um, so, I mean, there's, there's a mushroom out there for it. I'm, I'm pretty sure um, just about everything. Um, so these antibiotics that we've got, if we were to discover a new antibiotic right now today, we would not see that antibiotic on the shelf available for the public um, in, in under 12 years. It takes 12 years from the point of discovery going through FDA trials, FDA approval to get that, that antibiotic onto the, um, a, sh a shelf um, for consumers to eat or to use. Um, and the problem is, is our pathogens are becoming resistant to these antibiotics before we even get them on the shelf. So before that 12 years is up, a lot of those pathogens have already figured out and started to build resistance against those antibiotics. Um, so the way that we do it is we will take a, uh, our mushroom um, that we think or we know to be uh, effective against certain pathogens. Um, and what we can do is we can create a little divot. We can simply push down into the substrate and create a little pool in which we will introduce a pathogen. So a little, little Johnny is sick, so we'll take little Johnny's throat swab, um, and then we're going to put it, whatever is making him sick on top of this, uh, this mushroom block here. And what that mushroom block is going to do is it's going to sweat to try and break down or defeat whatever pathogen we've introduced to it. Um, so you can see here on the left, this, this block has been inoculated with the pathogen, while the one on the right is clean, so it, it has no need to sweat. It has no need to release those enzymes or anything. Um, but inside that sweat, is that antibiotic. All we have to do is simply collect that sweat, and we have a custom-made uh, antibiotic for whatever pathogen we've introduced to it. And this happens in less than a week. It only takes three, four days to, to do this. Um, and this, this liquid, we, we could very well dilute this, too. It might not need full-strength liquid in order to defeat, defeat that pathogen. 
Um, so typically what we'll do after this is we'll do a serial dilution. Um, we'll take varying concentrations of this liquid to match against the competitor again to see exactly how much is needed uh, to, to fight that off, how much is needed to be effective. So we've done this with uh, shiitake against staph. We've got a, uh, a golden reishi that, uh, that beats strep, strep streptococcus py pyogeny. We've got a turkey tail that feed, defeats salmonella. And this is an example of that serial dilution. That's how we do that. We'll just simply take one gram or a 10 mil sample, and we'll take one mil and dilute it down into nine mils of water. Then we'll take one milliliter of that and we'll keep doing that until you get all the way down to the 12th there. Um, and by the time you get there, it's, it's virtually non-existent. Um, that your, your enzymes are no longer in there. So I'm assuming when you say you've done this, this is lab only? You haven't used it on like living animals or anything? Uh, well, so yeah, it is by no means fit for human trials right now, um, strictly, strictly because we do not have the necessary equipment to be able to analyze that liquid and tell you that it's not toxic for a person. We know that that liquid is toxic to whatever pathogen it is, but we don't know if it's bad for the humans or not. Um, and so we, we're uh, waiting to take this to the next stage until we can get the equipment necessary. Um, we, Mushroom Mountain is a uh, self-funded. Um, we don't we don't work with, uh, collaborate with any schools or any uh, funding, um, strictly because we want the right store information. Trad used to work with uh, Clemson um, and teamed up on a few things, but what he realized is that Clemson owns the rights to all of the information, all of the research that he's doing, mm -hmm. Clemson owns the rights to it then. So we've strayed away from that and we're pursu pursuing this ourselves, um, strictly because we don't want this information getting to, into hands that we don't want it in. Uh, we we want to be able to do what we think is right with this stuff. Um, so it's going to be a little bit more of a slow process, um, but I think that we'll, we'll get there. Um, so that's, yep, that's the next on the list here in the next couple of years. Um, we're, we're transitioning from an 8,000 square foot warehouse now into a 42,000 square foot warehouse. Um, we've got a, a classroom built up in there, and we're, we're building some growing rooms. Analytical laboratory is next on the list. Um, so hopefully soon we'll be able to analyze that liquid and take it, take it to the next step. Now, a couple of people might have accidentally tried some at home when they were sick, um, and it, we, we think it works, but, but who knows? So, and this is the inhibitory test. So we would take each one of those, uh, those samples, those diluted samples, to drop it on the uh, Petri dish, and then we can test for inhibition again, put our, our mushroom back on there, or our pathogen, and see exactly how much of that is needed to, to fight it off. <laughs> all right. So that's, that's pretty much all that I've got for you guys today. Do you